sourcing historical documents is one of the most difficult things we ask our students to do. But the thing is, it like, it sounds like it ought to be easy. Like, hey, I gave you an acronym, HAPPY, go forth and source your documents. But that acronym is ironic because when it comes to sourcing, my students more often look, uh, unhappy. So I want to show you a way to solve that problem, and that's what we're going to do in this video. And I'm going to split this into two videos. In this one, I'm just going to show you how to introduce sourcing, and then in the next one, I'm going to show you how to teach the skill. So first things first, before we get into methodology, let me just outline the basics for the new teachers among us. On the rubric for the document-based question, a student can earn one point for successfully sourcing at least three documents. And they give the student four options for performing the skill. They can discuss the document's historical context, audience, purpose, or point of view. And then they have to demonstrate why that analysis is significant to their argument. And that's where we get happy from. And sometimes students get confused and they think they have to choose three documents and perform all of those sourcing skills for each document. But no, they only have to perform one skill for each of the documents that they choose. Okay, now that we're all on the same page as to what sourcing is and what is required, let me give you a technique that has worked for me in introducing this skill. If I've had any success in teaching my students to source documents, it's because I've taught them to do it with content that is unrelated to the curriculum. My students have actually developed some instincts for this by the time they're 15, 16, 17 years old, and I want to tap into that. So let me show you the image that I have shown them, and here it is. This is the cover of New York Magazine from October 31st, 2016. Now, before I go any further, notice what happened inside of you when I showed you that image, because it's the same thing that happens inside of my students when I show them. My conservative students get their dukes up, like, come on, Heimler, say something bad about Trump. Oh, I wish you would. And my liberal students start foaming at the mouth as well. Come on, Heimler, say something bad about Trump. I really wish you would. And the students who really don't care about politics are still a little nervous, like, is he gonna say something bad? I wish you wouldn't. And probably you had one of those reactions too. If you remember the video I made on how to hook students, that was one of the key ingredients to a hook. Get them emotionally involved. So if I introduce the lesson like this. All right, class, today we're going to learn how to source historical documents. You will find a copy of Lincoln's second inaugural on your desk. I mean, you know how that goes. But just by showing them this provocative image without any commentary, I've immediately got their attention. They are emotionally invested in what I'm about to say. And that's when I break their hearts and tell them, like, I'm not gonna make any commentary on this image, either negative or positive, but this is a document that needs to be understood. So then we get into sourcing, but I don't tell them that's what we're doing. I give them about as much information as they would have for any document on a DBQ. For this image, it's basically this. Cover of New York Magazine, a liberal-leaning publication, October 31st, 2016. So then I ask the class as a whole, or maybe I get them into groups, but I ask them, what does that date tell you? And you know, they see October 31st and they're gonna say Halloween, of course. But what about 2016? Well, it was the year of the presidential election. Okay, so when do we elect the president? And you know, someone's usually gonna know it's the first Tuesday in November, and if they don't, I tell them. And then I get them to tell me what they already know about the 2016 election, and I list it on the board. You know, okay, interesting, and then move on. Then I ask them to get inside the heads of the editors at New York Magazine. Like, if you only have this image to give you an impression of the magazine, who do you think the editors are publishing? this for. Remember, a magazine has to sell copies in order to stay in business. So who is going to see this cover and think, oh, I'm buying that? And some people will tell me that folks who oppose Trump would buy this magazine. And then I step back and I say, wait, what makes you say that? And then some students will mention that out of all the pictures they could have chosen, they got the one where he looks angry. Also, obviously the word loser is plastered across the middle very prominently, and it can't be because he lost the election because the election hadn't yet happened. Also, it's pretty standard for people featured on magazine covers to be digitally touched up and enhanced so that they look their best. Here, that did not happen. If anything, it looks like they may have exaggerated Trump's imperfections. Okay, so the people who are buying this are going to be people who don't like Trump and probably want the word loser to be true in the election. And then picking back on the previous responses, I ask, why do you think they published this so close to the election? That answer is easy, to show Trump in the worst possible light and to attach his name and face to a word that he would be mortified by. And then after all that work, I ask, you haven't read the article, nor am I going to ask you to do that, but do you think you can trust New York Magazine to give you trustworthy information about Donald Trump? And almost everyone, even those who don't like him, will say, I'm probably not. Okay, now why is that? Well, based on this picture alone, this seems to be more of an attack piece than a neutral information piece, and then we pull in all the observations we already made about the photo and the word in the middle, etc., to make that point. So after we're done, I point out how analyzing this image was actually pretty easy for them. Like, they knew the historical context and they could explain it. They could figure out the audience, they understood the purpose, and they could put their finger on whether or not this would be a trustworthy source of information. And then the next sentence out of my mouth is, you just sourced 
this document. And I tell them about the HAPPY acronym and I show them what they just did is exactly what they need to do with their DBQ documents. So you can already do it. So now let's practice on a historical document. And for a lot of students, the light bulb above their head goes on. And at that point, I wouldn't say sourcing becomes easier for them, but it certainly becomes a lot clearer. So with almost everything I do in class, I found that if I can introduce concepts in a non-curricular way, it really helps them when it comes time to apply it to the curriculum. All right, I hope that helped. And if you want me to keep making these videos, then by all means, subscribe. I've also got teacher resources for APUSH and AP World, if that's something that you're into, and the links are all in the description. Heimler out.